a day can seem to have no beginning and no ending. It becomes a 25-hour day that blends into the one that came before and the one that is to follow. necessary to be a military man to understand how long a day can be. A shot fired at Bien Ho, Da Nang, Quang Tri, Haiphong, or near Hanoi can strike home in any city, town, or hamlet of 50 sovereign states. 8,000 miles away can still be very close to home. And because it could come closer still, we share the conflict and the strength. We also share the understanding and the courage to prove that the honor of a nation's word has greater meaning than formal letters written on a scrap of paper. A man with a purpose. The range of his understanding of his purpose reaches far beyond his line of sight. He knows the big picture. He understands that attempts to intimidate by force must be resisted by force before intimidation becomes a way of international life. And this he also knows. He and the thousands like him, fighting and sweating on the ground, are the spearheads of our Department of Defense total effort, an effort concentrated to help the men on the ground to achieve their purpose and their mission. Above field and jungle, close air support. Help clear the way for the man on the ground. Reinforcing. Return to care and safety, those who have taken as well as given. Support those men during the long hours of daylight and the longer hours of darkness. Support them with B-52s against concentrations of troops and supplies. Give the enemy no chance to rest. Support them with tactical fighter bombers to keep up the pressure and help destroy our enemy's ability and desire to attack. Support them with hundreds of thousands of tons by airlift. The supplies come through, but there are other lines of supplies that flow the other way along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. It winds down from the north through mountain passes and under the cover of green top jungles. For North Vietnam, it is the lifeline for their aggression. Along the flank of Southern Asia, the coastline of North and South Vietnam takes the form of an elongated S, a demilitarized zone between the two countries along the 17th parallel at the sea was established by solemn treaty. To the north is China. To the west are Laos. Cambodia, Thailand, Burma, India, and Pakistan. 
Moving down from the north, men, oil, machines, the tools of war are fed along the Ho Chi Minh Trail to bolster the aggression in the south. They move by night over the narrow roads, through mountain passes, and along trails hidden by the jungle foliage. Trucks and pack-laden coolies by the tens of thousands. Usually, by day, they remain hidden in the jungle to venture out again at nightfall to carry their lethal burdens along their narrow lifeline of aggression. That lifeline must be severed. When it is repaired, as it always is, it must be severed again. The infiltration uh, increases in both men and equipment has required a very sharp increase in petroleum imports. Since the first of this year, the average monthly import petroleum into North Vietnam have increased 50 to 70 percent above the comparable period in 1965. Stocks on hand prior to the attack were estimated to represent about two to four months of supply. The increased importance of petroleum to the enemy's military efforts is further attested by his action to improve the routes of infiltration. Some of these routes are new, some have been widened, some have been upgraded for all weather use. Bypasses have been built, and bamboo canopies or trellises have been built over the jungle roads in many places in order to inhibit observation of them from the air. A result of the greatly increased movement of men and supplies by truck and by motor powered junk has been a shift from a small arms guerrilla type operation against South Vietnam to a quasi conventional military operation which involves major supplies, major weapons, and heavier equipment. Every gallon of fuel, every gun, bullet, even every ration of rice destroyed north of the 17th parallel may mean the life of a man on the ground south of the 17th. The military call it interdiction. That is the mission of those who fly to the north. Support the men on the ground by strangling the supply routes. They fly from the decks of our Navy's carriers. They fly from the surface of the land, the supersonic weapons of our Air Force's tactical fighters. They turn their noses north, north toward Mugia Pass, toward the fuel storage areas near Hanoi, north to interdict the trains carrying in supplies. The pilots do the flying. The ground crews keep them flying. It's an around-the-clock operation. Fly the mission, maintain the aircraft, repair the battle damage so that the next mission can be flown. No one counts the hours in a day. They keep close track of the months and weeks that they have left to sweat out to complete their 12-month tour of duty. But they don't count the hours in a day. All activity is monitored in aircraft vehicle control. Each operation is on a fixed time schedule. Often planes have to fly on paper before they can fly on missions. Nobody's job is easy, but then Nobody ever said it would be. Every so often, fellows will ask, why me? Why should I be here? One way or another, they have to find the answer for themselves. Usually, they do find the answer. Then, they have another question. What more can we do? The answer to that one is simple. Work your guts out for the men who fly the planes. A pilot's tour of duty is a 100 missions. One hundred missions to be flown. A hundred targets still unknown. But it's my belief that my thunder chief strikes a telling blow to help G.I. Joe. Till a hundred missions I myself
the pilots, a day can start at 2.30 a.m. or earlier, or any time. Somebody's son, somebody's father, maybe everybody's hope. Never before has air war demanded such degrees of judgment and responsible self-discipline. In mission briefing at tactical operations, information pinpoints refueling tanker locations and gives us our ordnance configuration. We'll get call signs and radio frequencies to use for the F-4Cs, and our own F-105s will be flying cover against possible MIG attacks. Wing intelligence will have photos of our target area and what to expect in way of defenses. The anti-aircraft and small arms fire are heavy. Worse for us than the surface-to-air missiles, the SAMs, and they're bad enough. But destroying our targets will help cut the flow of supplies toward the south. Furthermore, the daily tonnage of supplies moved overland from North Vietnam into South Vietnam has increased about 150% in the past year. And the infiltration of armed personnel has increased about 120% during the same period. Before we suit up for a strike, each flight leader briefs his own flight. There are four in a flight, plus one extra, a spare, in case one of the four can't take off due to an aircraft mechanical problem. Our flight leader details our entry into the target area, and then our tactics for getting the heck out of there. We listen because we respect him, because he'll be leading the way in. Five men in a small briefing room. Many groups of five in many small rooms. Or maybe the minute and a half they'll be over the target area. They'll spend hours of flight planning and briefing. Pilots have always been fighting men. But to courage and daring, today you have to add the great technical skill and self-discipline demanded by their sophisticated weapons. But weapons no more effective than the men who fly them or those who keep them flying. Case in point, combat aircraft are maintained with a dedication that results in flying hours at a rate three times normal usage. The line crews understand how much depends on them day after 25-hour day. is a very decent fellow. But now he's been through the hours of pre-flight details. He can't help but hope that one of the other aircraft will show up with a minor hydraulic leak or a cut tire. Sometimes that happens, but not today. supersonic blasts of power in the open ocean of the air, ready to play their part in the overall coordinated effort. There are other flights in the sky. The F-4Cs are en route. At the same moment in time, the big choppers, affectionately known as the Jolly Greens, are on their way with A-1Es for their protective escort. Their object is to stay as close as possible to the target area, so that if a pilot in one of the attack planes has to hit the parachute, then they can move in to pick him up. If there's enemy ground fire, those A-1Es dive in to keep the enemy's heads down. KC-135 tankers have been waiting to refuel the tactical fighter bombers en route to their targets. Those KC-135s will keep orbiting in case any of the boys run short of fuel on the way home. The overall coordination is the result of the total plan by the Department of Defense team effort, the Army, the Navy, and the Air Force. 
most people will ask pilots the same question over and over. Aren't you scared? The answer is always pretty much the same. Sure, we're scared. Until we button down the hatch. We're a one-man sort of operation. We're our own navigator, radio man, radar operator, and bombardier. Getting into the target, we have to take evasive action. Then it's pop up, dive in, drop the bombs, and get the heck out of there. You watch your fuel. You go over in your mind what the intelligence boys will want to know about the results. At the target, the ground defenses, all the details. You might be scared when you start, but after that, you just don't have the time. precise and efficient as the complex instruments with which it is equipped. One flight of many flights. And there isn't a combat pilot who doesn't know it. Every bullet, every gallon of oil, every mortar stopped north of that 17th parallel can mean the life of one man, 10 men, 100 men south of that parallel. Control has picked up a radio call for help from a pilot whose aircraft was hit and who had to eject. He has contacted the Jolly Greens and given them a fix on the downed pilot's approximate position. started filling up with smoke. I punched out. When that parachute blossomed, I took a long, deep breath. Then I landed in the trees, and I don't really remember how I managed to climb down to the ground. I let out a shout for help on my radio, then scrambled up the hill to get as close to the top as I could. I shot off some pen flares when I saw the A1Es and the Jolly Green. It's hard to put into words exactly how I felt when I knew that Jolly Green was going to get me out. Let's just say I prayed a little, on my own account, and for those guys of search and air risk. One hundred missions to be flown. It's good to know you're not alone. If a shrapnel stuff means I have to jump, then the jolly green will pick me up clean. Till a hundred missions I myself have flown. One flight's mission has been completed, but the long day's work is far from over. First, will come the detailed intelligence debriefing at Tactical Operations Center. After the official debriefing, flight leaders hold a session for critiquing their flight's performance as a unit and as individuals. Was there a delay in acquiring the target? Did one of the men press too low? Did they regroup promptly after hitting the target? Was element integrity maintained? You can never stop learning. 
you might get away with an error in judgment one day. Tomorrow, you may not be as lucky. One flight of many flights. But operations continue around the clock. For the ground crews, it's 12 hours or more a day. Six days or more a week. It could be drudgery if every man on the ground didn't know and understand that they are the ones who make it possible for those who fly to complete their missions. It's about 13.30 hours now, half past one in the afternoon of a day like every other day. Another flight takes off on another mission. Now, those who went out earlier have a couple of hours off duty. 100 missions to be flown. A hundred bridges to be blown On my left and right The rest of my flight Help keep me alive in my 105 Till a hundred missions I myself have flown No matter what they do or how relaxed they seem Pilots always wonder what tomorrow's target will be, a milk run or a tough one. The answer comes at about 1,800 hours, when flight planning for the next morning strike starts. Usually, flight planning takes two or three hours. On a new tough target, that time can easily be doubled. A fragmentary order, FRAG for short, comes to the Wing Tactical Operations Center and is the small part of the overall order that relates to the fighter wings. The orders come down from DOD and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Then at wing level, they are broken down and missions assigned to the squadrons. There are many frags that make up a day's total coordinated effort. We believe this essential to help safeguard the freedom of South Vietnam and to save the lives of those South Vietnamese, Americans, Australians, New Zealanders and Koreans who are fighting to ensure that freedom. The aircraft our pilots fly are compact, highly maneuverable machines. They have the inherent speed and versatility to be effective in air-to-air -air or air-to-ground combat. But they are only machines. They must be maintained. The record of keeping flying hours at a rate three times normal use speaks loudly and clearly for the kind of men who work with their hearts as well as with their minds and hands. Men are brave in many ways, and there are many ways in which a man can show his courage. Courage can't be judged by a casual glance or the sound of a voice. Any fighting man will tell you, you must know fear in order to find your true strength. Want a portrait of a hero? Take a snapshot of a pilot. Or another. Or another. Move your camera out to the line for long shots. Or for close-ups. Carry it inside aircraft vehicle control to watch the men who often don't even see the plane. They help keep flying. Let your camera travel into the air to fly with the men of the Aerospace Rescue and Recovery Service. You'll never find a man who thinks himself a hero or even considers himself as particularly brave. But they all share a common bond and a common pride. They are all working members of the same fighting team, fighting each in his own way, trying to slow down and, if possible, to break down the flow of supplies to the south and to adversely affect the will of North Vietnam for carrying on their aggressive operations. The total task is large, and yet, as it always is, each small fragment of that total is very personal. Men may live 3,000 miles or more apart back home in the States, but here there are no state lines, no county lines, no country boys or city boys. 
No one asks their social position or who their ancestors might or might not have been. Nor do we as a nation know what we as a nation have done to have deserved men such as these. Perhaps they reflect the courage and the strength instilled in them by their mothers and their fathers. Perhaps it is the heritage of men who came before, men who stood at Concord Bridge, men who walked through Chateau Thierry, through the Ardennes Forest, and the undergrowth of Guadalcanal and Iwo Jima. Men who ranged the skies over Pacific atolls and over Africa and Europe half a world away. We do not know what we have done to produce men such as these, but we do know these are our men, our fathers, our sons, our brothers. It is only right that not only should we be proud of them, we can be proud of them. Lieutenants coming in behind this F, and they're uh, they just finished the 100th mission. Actually, they got cycled through to go back up to rest camp. One of our other pilots was shot down earlier, so they they've just got 101 missions, and uh, we're real proud of them because uh, first of all, not many lieutenants fly the 105, and secondly, to get 100 missions in it is outstanding. We think. So uh, we're going to meet him here at the end of the runway and take him on up to the uh, parking space, give him a bottle of champagne, and I imagine they're three happy boys. When all is said and done, you really cannot adequately relate a war. War is too potent, too personal. War is living and laughing and crying and dying. It has always been the man who fights who can best report a war, if he will. True, his story may be confused, sometimes harsh, sometimes boisterously non-committal, but it is real. This is one segment, one small insight into our present war. This is the 105 story. The story of fighter-bomber pilots flying daily over the armed camp of North Vietnam during the month of November 1966. These are the men of the 388th Tactical Fighter Wing, and in particular, the men of the 421st, the Fighting Cavalier Squadron. Well, what are they doing? He says, well, how do I tell if they're friendly? He says, well, if they come up with their hands over their heads, they'll be friendly. He says, no, one of these guys has got a gun. They guys said, well, how far are you from them? He said, well, standing right here by me. And he says, well, it must be friendly. <laughs> I feel they have a hundred. I thought I was going to kill myself on there, so you're on the truth. Jeez. F-O-D.
Inspector Pilot. Where? 238, Williams Air Force Base, Arizona. I figure I'll, I'll arrive there and I'll, I'll be real quiet, calm, and all that, and I'll go in and all the students will nudge each other and when they meet me and I'll be their instructor and they'll fly with me and they'll nudge each other and say, what did Lieutenant Rasmus do before he came here? And I'll, you know, it'll be all quiet and no one will know until finally there'll be graduation and we'll show up in, their, in mess dress and then I'll be with my air medals and my DFCs and my silver star and my commendation medal and my Vietnam service medal and all this stuff all the way across and I'll walk in with a slight limp and they'll, they'll say, tell me about it. And I'll say, oh, oh, it was nothing. It was nothing. <laughs> You know, but then for a week after, every time I crawl in the airplane, as I get in, I'll pull my leg in and I'll wince a little. And I'll say, what is it? And I'll say, oh, it's just an old war injury. <laughs> 45, 44. Right, 45, 44, 14. Yeah. How's this go? Very good? Yeah. Good. Good. How many is that? Well, 42, 43. Okay. Major Hyde. One mission, one counter, one for the month. Finally made the board. 99 hard ones to go. Uh, before you do this afternoon, you've got to put them on coming out for number 90. You've already got it. So you're going to get two today, huh? One more, I'll be able to make it bigger. One more, you'll be able to go red. He's been here about six months. It averages about six months for the tour. You're able to get two years and do about that much time. Because he's on and on, he's going to be talking about four years back. No, you really can't blame him. Okay, you can't tell him any of them. We have four people who look like to finish up by the end of this month. They should be home for their families for Christmas. Well, you think you're going to make some for Christmas? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> well, 67. Even though we are roughly 100 miles from any sort of civilization, morale is high here. I've noticed that. The men know what they're doing and why they're here. Well, if uh, we still have to be over here, I'll come right back and do what you do for me. You come right back and do another hit. You bet I will. things I've been over here for, such as the American way of life. I served in World War II in the Southwest Pacific, and served during Korea, but when I leave here, I still have some time to do it, so. Can I make it a grill? Uh, probably. Hey, brother, we don't have a morale problem. Here we sit out here in the middle of a strange country and away from uh, everything that's familiar to us. And I'm not speaking of pilots now, I'm talking to the maintenance people. But uh, there is no morale problem. Of course, the pilots uh, couldn't have a morale problem. There's always something going. There's always something going. There's never a dull moment. If there, if there is a factor involved with a morale problem, it's fatigue. Yes, uh, I personally started to stage it. The man has put in a uh, hundred missions over North Vietnam to go home, get a rest, and then come back. However, I have uh, one pilot here that just insisted on uh, taking another hundred, and he's here. His name is uh, Lieutenant Victor. Yeah, I want to come back down. How come you get to stay here? Hey, <laughs> <laughs> work hard. You could have stayed here with me. Yeah, Mommy wouldn't have had any part to do with that. Yeah, okay. There's, there's the deal, you know. You're Mary, uh, let's face it, you know, if you like, if you like somebody well enough to be married with them, yeah, you don't want to be away from them for a year or eight months or anything like that. How are you going to explain to a wife that, uh, you know, put in for a concurrent tour, you know, that you're going to take flying over her? That uh, wouldn't happen. So I like me. I guess through this. Nah, that's why I'm sticking around. You know, I'm a bachelor. I got nothing going for me back in the States. And, uh, the flying's good. You don't have all the little nitpicking rules and regulations that you have to put up with it. Since we did it two months ago. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's still a lot better than it is back there now. But I just, 
you know, I enjoy it. And, uh, Jimmy, it's the kind of deal like everybody says, yeah, I'm waving a flag, but I'm not. But at the same time, you know, where are you going to, uh, where are you going to stop it at, you know? Where's, where's Connie? Is he going to wait till her in, uh, the Philippines or in Australia or San Francisco or Des Moines, Iowa, you know? You just stop it here or wait till somewhere later on. I don't think most of the people will think about that. They like me, you know, what, what happens, you know? If, uh, if I get shot down, I have two men, they'll never get me anyway. Hey, at yeah. least you were pretty mean until you shaved your mustache. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I couldn't stand that anymore. Our bombing objectives, I believe, can be very distinctly divided into two phases. Our interdiction program conducted in the southern portion of North Vietnam in an attempt to deny movement of the enemy into South Vietnam, and our strategic, if you will, objectives in the northern portion of North Vietnam in terms of attacking principal lines of communications, the Northeast and the Northwest Railroads, which comprise the two most major railroads in North Vietnam, also POL installations and other military supply and storage areas located in the Delta regions of North Vietnam. I just spared this flight here that's uh, getting ready to big angle to take off. It's, uh, we've got over 50 airplanes involved in this strike force. And it was uh, going to be a big raid up near the Hanoi area, but the weather's bad. Now they're going to various other areas. A spare's job. For every four airplanes we launch, we launch one spare off the other runway. In case one of the airplanes that we're having trouble with, they can fill in uh, in any four positions, any one of the four positions. He can, he's usually a leader, so in case the leader aboard, he can uh, fill in that spot. You can see this flight taking off now. And then the airplane standing by is the spare. He'll be uh, coming back up like me probably pretty soon. The spare is not a bad job because uh, you do launch quite a bit of the time. We like to fly and fight the floor. That's why we have a spare out there because if we didn't, we never get another airplane up in time. Yeah, I saw something funny down there. I did. 
We got you didn't bother the same car as the you did. You didn't? I didn't? No. There's a nice big bridge there. <laughs> Two percent. I was carrying about two percent back. And yeah, when that guy kept calling Mix, and we hadn't caught up with that flight in front of us yet then, and I'm sure we're going full blower, eating about 620 degrees. Yeah. Uh, this is not the answer. Don't worry, I was watching your six flight. Thanks a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I call you say by game. I was watching it too. Yeah, 
And up north, where the salmons are when it's heavy, you can't operate in a, a say, around cumulus buildup where you're going around the clouds because the sand will come right straight through them and hit you. And incidentally, the airplanes we have lost the sands has been in these conditions, so we have to avoid them. Well, maybe 150. I still have my speed, though. I, I, I got water right away at all times, so. Yeah, I got my speed. Do you remember what the weather was when we went into the top of it? Let's see, we were at 14, about 10,000. Yeah, we went to a layer of 10,000, and then uh, it was about from 10 to 9, and then from 9 to the ground in areas that were clear, but there was a scattered layer in there about uh, 5 or 6. <laughs> We've got the uh, EX3 on there yesterday. Yes, this is Henry, this is 24. Sorry, we lost two today. Okay, this one, two, three, four, and one is 25. Okay. Now, this is a CBU flight. This is, uh, what's the second flight? Low with uh, nice Tiger. And, uh, and then drive up there slow so you hit the red. I mean, so you're going to hit the CRC, you know, hit the red and the and uh, Y, uh, everything, so we're going to hit right on down here at TOT. Everything works out perfect, except the weather. The weather from our uh, indicates a small high pressure area centered just about over Hanoi, which should make for fairly good weather, except for restricted visibilities and haze. The clutch of this one is going to be the, the weather on Frederick tomorrow, the last five minutes into the target. Just that uh, weather just to the northwest and west. Hanoi area is 
about the time uh, you start turning off the tanker on the way up there, you begin getting butterflies and, uh, in your stomach, naturally, and uh, then you begin settling down to the task at hand of navigating and finding your way up there. And then once you arrive in the area, uh, you're generally pretty busy. And uh, although at times uh, <laughs> you're, you're pretty scared when you have to roll in on something up there, especially when you look down and see nothing but a black cloud or a uh, white cloud down below you. It's, uh, it's about as, as scary a mission as I've ever been on. Uh, I think it tries you to just about the maximum on uh, the missions. If you can get between uh, a ridge between you and that radar site, they can't guide a missile at you. It's just when you get down in the delta in the flat line, the 30 mile ring around uh, the city of Hanoi is, is a bear. Because it's flat, you have no protection. And uh, I don't know how true it is, but to say it's the most heavily defended place in the uh, history of aerial warfare. I've been there and I believe it. Everybody wear your black belt today, guys.
Oh, you mean when I was, uh, yeah. when you were wrecking the road? Yeah, yeah, I was flying. I was trying to fly a wing. Yeah. Kind of like this one. Yeah, well, he was bleeding. You got it. No, you just press out. I'll stay away from you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's no problem. But you see the position that, that you want. You don't want to get down like this because you're getting a flat. You stay up like this, and then when he disappears, you'll try to go high on him. Then when he reverses, he can look up. See, every time you look out, he looks right down there and see your wingman. That's but what you, you want, want to do. When you go to the outside, you don't want to get too high because if he turns into you, that's what happened to me that one. Yeah. He turned into me, and I was high, and I got no place to go. Yeah. Don't get too high, and don't get too low. When you get too low, if they shoot at, at him, and you're lower, they'll probably hit you. But if you get too high, he turns into you, so I guess you get it blocked out. I've told you how complicated the weapon system is, so that it only can be effectively uh, operated and utilized against the enemy by two professionals. And our pilots are professional pilots. We, have, we do have a few youngsters out of the training school, but most of uh, our pilots have been in the Air Force 10 to 12 years or longer. And in fact, we have some grandfathers here that are uh, fighting this war. The rendezvous at 1350. Well, we'll have enough fuel after leaving that tank to make three or four runs away. Let's look at the car. My best day uh, was uh, the 5th of July when uh, I attacked and destroyed the uh, Four Sam site in one 25 minute mission. And this came about because uh, in uh, escorting the strike flight, two SAM sites came up on our way in. We had to uh, attack these boys to turn them off the air to get into the target area. While in the target area, another SAM site came up threatening the strike force. And of course, we attacked and got him. And then on the way back out, another SAM site came up to block our exit out of the target area, which was about 15 or 20 miles north of Hanoi, and uh, we only had one part of rockets and uh, 20 millimeter cannon ammunition remaining, but he fired two SAMs at us, and we managed to acquire him visually and put the rockets on him and machine gun him out of commission. This was the best day I've had, and I don't care to go through another one of those. <laughs> A little too much for an old man. Yeah. I've come up with one thing that, in my own mind, makes the Air Force a good organization. And was one of the reasons I stayed in it after I got in the fighters. And that's the people that are in it. And I think this has been uh, most vividly demonstrated to me over here. The, uh, I don't think you can get more diversified type of an organization, people of diversified background. We have uh, some old heads from Korea, some uh, young heads from the academy, and we got the uh, world's greatest C-52 fighter pilot over there, Bob Loken. <laughs> a few other people from SAC, ADC, and 12th Air Force headquarters and things like that. And we made a pretty good organization. I think we kind of put the squadron, if we could tell it to the world, we put it on the map. And I'm very happy to have served with each and every one of you two. So if I could, if I could try and be able to get down south to uh, working 100s or F5s or A1s or geez, I don't care, as long as it's uh, close to that support. If I can swing that, I'm going to just try to go from maybe back to state TV wide upgrade and down there. If not, I'll stick around and fly an O-1 or an A-1. Check you out right up north, you know. You ever had a car that you might not make down Oh, no. Yeah, but, uh, uh, I've been going to pay for 15 years. Uh, it's my job. As of right now, I've got three children. I've got a six-year-old boy and a seven-year-old girl and a seventeen-year-old girl. So, uh, uh, I'm just watching kids grow up so forth. I don't care if they're North Vietnamese kids or spouse or, or what have you. I, I had no desire to go bomb villages and, and kill women and children at all. Uh, I've been very careful not to do that personally. I'm very careful. I 
think most of the pilots in the squad and I are very careful with where we put their bombs so that uh, they don't accidentally uh, hit women and children and other stuff. How do you feel? Uh, I think they're a great. Uh, I don't know of anyone that's just going to go over and drop a bomb in a village uh, because that's not doing anything for the war effort. We want to get the, uh, get the targets of military importance. On the 13th of September, we were flying a bombing mission to North Vietnam. We just discovered a bunch of missiles on transporters. Just finished dropping our ordnance on them. We were looking for something to straighten and found a flank sight. And uh, we were getting started to make a pass. And I took a direct hit to me, 3757. Called I was hit, leaving the area. They didn't hear my radio transmission because the before man thought it was a missile. <laughs> Called me out as a Sam. And then number three man said, No, that's two, he's on fire. And I got about a minute and 10 or 20 seconds flying time out of the aircraft, got about 40 miles away from where I was hit. And I had a minor explosion, lost hydraulic pressure. The aircraft pitched down. And uh, I ejected in you know, an almost uncontrolled situation. About 525, 550 knots, two negative keys. That's when I hurt my ankle. Caught my foot, injection process getting out. Everything else was uneventful after the chute opened. Sound landed in the trees, got radio out, talked back to the flight. And they said the rescue aircraft was on the way. It took him about 45 or 50 minutes to get to me and about five or six minutes to pick me up. <laughs> well, that's good. You know, you get up in the 90s and you got 10 to go and you say, well, I'm going home pretty soon, so I got to tell these guys something. They go lay in bed at night and you think of things to tell them. And a run for us. <laughs> 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 and a wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to tell you guys something right now. This is my speech. I don't need to be uh, Incidentally, I have a three hour speech prepared. Forget it. <laughs> something I'm damn proud to have, besides working with all you guys and with your names here. I don't really need this picture frame with you. With the maze? I'm going to remember you guys. <laughs> bomber pilots at Karat Air Base, Thailand. For the flyer, living the hell over Hanoi, facing up to the odds, there is the simple yet poignant phrase, there ain't no way, there ain't no way, there ain't no way. But there comes the day for most when the job is done. I won't even say to the rest of you guys, no, there's no way. There's no way. Major G has 